let's get started. I really enjoy conferences like this. You've got a huge range of interesting speakers who've come in, interesting people from all sorts of companies building all sorts of fascinating things, who've come here to share with you interesting knowledge, ideas, different ways of thinking, interesting new ways of solving problems. What I want to talk to you today about is JavaScript, really, and ways that you can write better JavaScript to more effectively manage asynchronous processes. But what I'm really talking to you about is how you can communicate better with your code, how you can share your knowledge, your interesting solutions to problems, and the meaning and intent behind what you're actually building better with your fellow developers. Some context first, I work for a company called Resin.io. We build infrastructure so that you can develop and deploy and manage software for the Internet of Things. You can sort of think of it as Heroku for hardware. You get push and you deploy to a thousand Raspberry Pis or drones or wind turbines, whatever. As you can imagine, that's quite complicated. There's a lot of machinery, literally, going on under the hood here. And we've built a lot of this in JavaScript. So this is where I'm coming from here. We're building large JavaScript applications that are very complex and that we have to be able to build maintainably. We have to be able to understand these and we have to be able to change them. There's a nice quote from Martin Fowler about this generally. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. Everything you write as a developer has two audiences and the computer is not the hard one. You can write some terrible, disgusting, horrible things that will still work, but you won't understand six months from now. Your colleagues will hate and that you won't be able to use to effectively actually solve your problem, to actually build something that is going to last, is going to be maintainable for the future. Let's talk about JavaScript. We're going to be looking at JavaScript today um, in quite a bit of detail. This is going to get relatively technical. I'm going to try not to assume too much knowledge about the newer ES6 side of things, but we're not going to go through the other existing bits in too much depth. Do just try and look panicked and wave if I'm going through any of those too fast, and I'll try and manage this and see how we go. We're going to be looking particularly at async development within JavaScript. And by asynchronous, I mean operations where you start a process and then you continue doing some things in the meantime, and then eventually you look at the result of that process. You trigger some other event once that process completes, as opposed to synchronous operations where you trigger something and you block and wait and then continue. This is something that, as a JavaScript developer, you do a lot. Anytime you're making network requests, anytime you're reading from files in Node, anytime you're waiting for somebody to click a button, all of these are requiring you to think about asynchronous development. This is a fundamental part of how you write JavaScript all the time. And people think JavaScript is pretty good at this because of that, uh, but it's not really in a lot of ways. JavaScript has made things much better than many, many other languages. It's drastically removed huge problems and put us in a pretty good place to get stuff working here. But it doesn't actually give you any tools to directly do this. It doesn't give you any support. We've kind of hacked some stuff on top. But JavaScript itself doesn't do this well. And we should be able to improve on that. Let's start with the first half of this, taking away the challenges of async. There's two key technical things JavaScript does are making your life much easier in this sense compared to writing async in Java or Python. Firstly, the runtime itself is event-driven. It runs to completion, and it's single-threaded, typically. What that means is most JavaScript code you write is triggered by some event, the page being ready, somebody clicking a button, a network request coming back. It then starts some code, which runs some more code, which calls some functions, perhaps. Each of those functions finishes. The calling function finishes. We go right the way through to the end, and then we pick up the next event on a single thread that is just picking up events, running the code to completion, and picking up the next event. This is a nice model, and this takes away a lot of problems that you have if you try and write concurrent code in other languages. You don't have to worry about operation-level race conditions. You don't, in JavaScript, write to a, a variable, read from a variable on the next line, and get a different result. 
if you try and do async in other languages, you get race conditions like this, and you have to watch out for this kind of stuff. And instead of interleaving on operations like that, in JavaScript we interleave just on whole events. And that gives you a much simpler model to work with. This is notably actually though part of the runtime, not the language. The JavaScript spec says nothing about this. This isn't a requirement at all. This is just the way that browsers work and that V8 as used in Node works. So this isn't a hard requirement, which is why the language doesn't really integrate with it. We also have an asynchronous ecosystem, which makes this much easier. In Java or Python, you'd be calling libraries that would block, and you'd have to wrap them and deal with that. In JavaScript, every library you use, anything you care about, is going to be written to work asynchronously. That's not going to be something that trips you up most of the time. So this takes away a lot of our challenges, and this makes life much simpler. But it doesn't actually make it simple. Writing async code isn't something that just magically happens as easily as if you were writing synchronous code. There's a bunch of extra complexity you have to think about because we don't have any direct way to express it. The way you typically write async with callbacks or promises is layering some stuff over the APIs that exist just using the low-level tools we have around, using functions and saying, if I pass you this, you promise you'll call it back when that network request is done, and having enough conventions and things, that, that sort of works. But you're still very much using go-tos to write if here. You want clear, built-in, direct expressions of what you're actually trying to do, not just something that works. And we need these high-level constructs. We need something that can directly express what we're actually trying to do. Run this operation, wait until it's finished, and then give me the result and let me continue with no other complexity, no other details. We want to say that. And until recently, you couldn't really do that. There wasn't really an option, and the best we had was callbacks. Callbacks are the easy example of this where we're trying to express these complex uh, async processes, read this file, and then give me the results of the file when you're done, then I'll run this code afterwards. And we're doing that by just passing around functions. The standard way we do anything in JavaScript, you pass around a function. And that means that things that are quite easy to describe directly to a person become more painful to actually write in JavaScript. So this code, for example, as a human readable description of a program, is fairly easy to understand. I'm going to get a user from the database, I'm going to get that user's best friend, I'm going to get the picture of that friend, I'm going to add a moustache to everybody in the picture, and then I'm going to put that picture up on the page. And this is some important part of my production system, and I'd like everybody to be able to understand how this code works, so that we can all change it, and we can all clearly see what the function that does this is actually doing, without any distractions. And if you try and write this in callbacks, you get something that looks more like this, which, certainly for me, doesn't immediately jump back to that previous description. It doesn't immediately become clear what exactly this is doing. If you're familiar with callbacks, you'll see yourself, as you read this, skipping the irrelevant bits, jumping to the meaningful parts in your head. You're filtering that implicitly, and that's a bad sign in itself. Right? There's a whole bunch of code here that you are actively ignoring. This is pretty messy. Um, one of the main problems that's causing mess here is error handling. All the way through, we have to keep checking for these errors and potentially catching stuff and calling that back out. And this doesn't actually even catch all the errors. If all of these functions are well-behaved and for any possible error, they call their callback with the error, this will work. But if any of these throw a synchronous error directly at any point, then this is just going to silently explode, and you're not even going to know about it. It's just not going to work without you having any possibility of dealing with that. And if you actually do want to deal with that, you have to wrap each of these in a try-catch, which looks something like this. That might be a little bit unreadable at the back. That's kind of my point. This is a horrible mess. This is what you have to do if you want to get this all working totally, perfectly, and reliably. And you shouldn't have to do that. You're having to do this because you're not quite using the right tool for the job. You're using a tool that works. And so we've improved on this recently with ES6, with promises. ES6, or officially ES2015's answer to this problem. Who here has used promises, written some code using them? Yeah, probably three quarters, maybe a bit over that. Great, OK. We'll do a very quick recap then. A promise is a representation of an ongoing process. So you've got an object that represents, say, a network request that is going on, which initially, probably, is going to be pending, and then eventually is going to be fulfilled with a value or rejected with some error. And it gives you a concrete representation of this. 
in a way that callback doesn't. You have an object and you can say, pass this object to somebody, and they can say, okay, when that's done, I'll do this, in a way that you can't with callbacks. You've got this solid representation. Actually building a promise looks like this. You call new promise and the promise that's returned is resolved when the resolve callback is called, or rejected when the reject callback is called, or you can call promise.resolve and create a promise that immediately resolves with a given value, or dot .reject and create a promise that is immediately rejected with a given error. Once you've got a promise, typically from actually calling an API rather than necessarily doing this directly yourself, you can then call dot .then and we can chain these together. We can say once data is loaded, give me the data and I will do something with it, like transform it, and then once it's transformed, continue here. And in between these steps, we resolve any promises that are returned. If transform data returns a JavaScript object, that immediately gets passed to the next step in the chain. If it returns a promise, that is resolved to the promise's final value. And then, after waiting for that, we call the next step in the chain. So you can return steps to wait for along the way. This pretty nicely solves our previous problem with that, trying to chain those operations together with callbacks and gives us a much cleaner, nicer syntax to do that. And we can also drastically improve our ability to catch errors with this. We can put dot .catch on the end and any errors which appear in these stages here will propagate forwards to the first catch that comes up. And that catches both asynchronous and synchronous errors. So really easily, anything that goes wrong, either something in our function or something that fails in one of the promises we return and wait for, will come through and be easily caught and managed or rethrown or whatever. And then on top of that, we can do promise.all and wait for many promises. So this gives us a promise back, which eventually resolves to the combined values of all of these once they're done. Or promise.race, which is eventually fulfilled with the first value that comes back, or error. These are our current best solution. This is the way that most nice, new, trendy JavaScript libraries work. And it's a nice model, and it does improve things quite a bit. But there's still quite a lot of ceremony here. This is not as clean and easy to read as synchronous code by quite a long way. When you go between steps, you have to say dot then new function, OK, pull in the argument, cool, great, and pull all that through. And much worse, this couples function scopes with async operations. This is a kind of tricky abstract point. But anywhere that you have an async operation, you have to finish the previous function scope and start a new one. You have to have separate functions for these individual then steps, and the async operations happen between them. That means if you have anything that only operates within one function scope, like everything in JavaScript, then you're stuck. You cannot have an if statement that goes over an async operation, because you, if statements must run to completion entirely within a function. You can't have a loop. You can't even do variable scoping very nicely. Variables are either scoped to a specific step within this, or the entire thing, and potentially much more. And that can really get quite complicated. We can't use normal JavaScript constructs with this, because normal JavaScript constructs work only within a single function scope, not over many. Let's see what this actually looks like. So let's say you want to go and get the data for a user. You want to get the timeline for that user, because we're building some terrible version of Facebook. And then you want to put both of those together on the screen. That, with promises, looks something like this. And you can start to see the pain here. We go call get user and we get the user. And then we have to export that into a global variable, because otherwise it wouldn't be visible in the next stage, because these are separate functions. And that show user, user wouldn't be able to get at the user. This is a bit messy, it's a bit nasty. We'd rather not do that. There's cases where this gets much worse. Let's say you want to loop over a list of tasks. You want to run each task, one by one, sequentially, get the result, put it in an array, and return that array. You could describe that to a person clearly and understandably in two or three seconds. If you try and write that with promises, you get something more like this. You have to build up this promise that you accumulate, and then within that, once you've chained all of those together, you have to build up these results that you accumulate in this slightly messy way with nested thens upon thens, and then you return the whole thing. And if you successfully glance at that and instantly understand the nice human description on the previous page, you've done very well. I don't think you can expect anybody else to glance at this and really easily see what's going on. This is messy code that doesn't clearly say what it's saying, what it's doing, 
it works, but it doesn't do, do so nicely. It doesn't do so maintainably in any useful way. And you can, there's other options. You can do this with reduce, but that becomes even less readable. You're fighting against the stream here because your loop has to finish entirely before the promises can start. Let's say, finally, you want to do a conditional. You want to say, if this op async operation is successful and this async operation is successful, then go do something else. We well, can't put an async operation inside the test for an if. That doesn't make sense. That's not something that's possible. So you have to break it out and get something like this, where you actually do the test and you pass the result of that to another one, which checks the test and then maybe returns another promise, which does some stuff and then gets a can save variable and then checks that. And if you want to just glance at this if and see what can save actually means, you have to filter back through this and work out what's going on. And this isn't clear. This isn't saying what it's doing. Promises have given us a really nice underlying model, a concrete representation for an ongoing task, an object you can pass around that represents something that is still happening but will finish hopefully soon. But the actual API doesn't play nicely with JavaScript itself. JavaScript is tied to the function scopes and promises break them constantly every time you try and do anything asynchronous and create this total separation between your asynchronous processes and your synchronous steps. And we'd like to bring those much closer so that we can manage these more easily and effectively. All of this really comes down to run to completion semantics. Because your function has to run to the end before the next event can get picked up, your function has to finish before your asynchronous operations can start. If we could find some way of writing code that ignored those, we could make this a bit better. Let's take a detour. Generators. Who knows anything about generators? Who's used some generators in JavaScript? Stick with that. Few hands at the back. Maybe four or five people. Generators are very exciting. They, too, are part of ES6, but they've been coming a bit more slowly. I think they're everywhere except iOS now. Generators are functions that repeatedly yield values. You can kind of think of this as repeatedly returning values. They run up to a point, they spit out a value, and then later you can resume them from that point and they continue. But you define them just like normal functions. This means that they are functions that pause. They are functions that no longer worry about, necessarily, run to completion semantics, and functions that you can stop and start despite using normal JavaScript all the way through. What this actually looks like is this. So here we have function star that defines a generator constructor, and then we write some code, and at some point in that we yield. When you yield, it pauses, potentially spits out a value, maybe later takes in a value as input, and then later can be continued. And actually using this looks like this. We call the function to get the generator itself, and then we call dot next. When you first call dot next, we start this function. We say n equals zero, while true, that's true, yield n. So we yield zero. And the return value you get from next is value zero, and done false. And it done becomes true later once you actually get to the end of the function, if you explicitly return at some point. When we call next again, we start from that point. So we then say n plus equals one, okay, n is now one. And then we go round that loop, and we yield one. And when you call next again, we say, okay, n now equals two. And we go round and we yield again. And this lets you write functions that keep producing values, potentially infinitely, as here. And the main use for this really is iteration. This lets you do some nice stuff, like looping over every number. You can lazily generate numbers, lazily generate a list of numbers here. And we can just loop over all natural numbers here, or loop up until 1,000, like this. And this gives us a nice, interesting tool. This can get more complicated. You can take input into generators. So here, we call sum.next, and that runs to the first yield, which is the first thing that happens. When you call next again, we call next one. And this passes one into the generator, so that we end up at the top of that function with var accumulator equals one. And we resume with input. And it then runs forwards from there. So accumulator is one, while true is true. Next addition equals yield accumulator. This spits out accumulator, which is one, and then waits for input and pauses at this point. So next one has returned one, and then we say next five. And that resumes from this point, so we get next addition equals five. 
accumulator plus equals next addition, so accumulator is now six, and we go round and we spit out accumulator again and wait for inputs. And this is a function that keeps taking inputs and adding them up all the way and spitting them out as it goes. And each time you call next, it returns the running total. And this lets you do output and input at the same time and pause as you go. So this is kind of weird in itself. There's a very interesting model going on here. There's some totally unrelated, very interesting things you can do with generators in JavaScript. But where it gets really interesting is if we mix this with promises, and all of a sudden, you can start building better ways of defining asynchronous code. What we want to do is write code that looks like synchronous code, but any time it wants to wait, yields the promise. It says, OK, I've got a network request. All right, I'm going to yield that. I'm going to pause. I'm going to pass this back to whoever's calling me. They're going to deal with that promise. And when that promise is finished, they're going to input back the final result. And I'm going to resume from there with that result. And you can keep doing this. If we try and actually write that, let's say we're going to go back to the conditional example, we want to do if async operation and async operation, then we can write code, working code, that looks like this. We wrap our generator with a spawn function that's going to handle those promises, and then we just write a generator that any time it wants to do an async operation, just yields that async operation and says, OK, I've got a thing I'm waiting for, resume me when this is done. And spawn is going to sit outside and just start the generator. And when it spits out a promise, handle the promise, get the resulting value, resume the generator, and keep doing this. And this code now is normal, synchronous looking, more or less, code. You can use if statements. Variable scoping works as you think it should work. It's like writing synchronous, simple JavaScript code. But you can do asynchronous operations within it. Actually, implementing spawn is a little bit tricky. Um, I've got a small example here without error handling, which makes this more complicated. It's worth trying to play around and understand the details of this, simply because if you can understand generators and promises and how to glue them together, you understand the next stage completely. What's going on here is that we get the generator, and then at each step, we take the input of the previous step, we put that into the generator, we get whatever the generator spits out as a promise, and then if it's done, that's just our final value, and we're done. And if it's not done, then we wait for that promise that it's spit, spat out. And we then resume the generator at the next step with the final result of that promise, this value dot then. And spawn notably actually returns step here, which is a promise. So when you wrap something with spawn, you just get a promise, and anything else can use it just as if it were promisey code. I don't want to delve too deep into this right now, and I will send the slides around later so you can take a little bit of a look and play around with this. But by putting these together, you can write code like this that actually works. These two put together are all you need to get a very basic proof of concept example put together. And this is really interesting because now everything involved is promises. Spawn returns a promise, and the methods we're calling are all returning promises that we're waiting on. But you don't write any of promise-driven code directly at all. You don't have to use the promise API. You don't have to deal with the bits of pain in that, despite the fact the underlying representation is all promises. We're using the whole promise model, the whole underlying promise code, but the API disappears. We build a new, nicer abstraction over the top that lets you just write synchronous code. This bit might be a little bit tricky, but we can make it nicer and smooth it out. And this is where this last step comes in with async await. Async await is a, an upcoming new JavaScript feature that takes this to the kind of next step, the logical conclusion. This is a stage four draft, which is the final stage for any JavaScript proposal. The, uh, the standards process at the end of January is going to define what's going to be in the ES 2017 spec, and that is going to include almost certainly every stage four draft and most of the stage threes. This is going to be standard JavaScript as of the end of January, once that standard gets finalized. This is exactly the same magic. The underlying semantics are just the same as the stuff we've just seen, the same ideas, but built in directly to the language. And we take that previous example, and we translate it into something like this. Rather than thinking about generators and spawn, you just say async function. And anytime you want to wait for something, you just say await promise. 
And what that does is pass that promise off to the runtime and say, resume me in the middle of this normal looking function whenever this promise is done. And you write normal synchronous code using normal synchronous tools, if and loops, and try catch and variables as you expect them. And you can write asynchronous code sprinkled in between that just works. If we take a look back through some of the other examples we've seen here, the terrible version of Facebook, for example, when you want to get a user and get the timeline and then show both of them, now becomes easy and clean. Very, very simple to read. Just understand. You can look at this and tell what it's doing very easily. Finally, the async in a loop pattern, again, becomes really, really nice and simple and easy. We get some results. We go through each of the tasks. We wait for each task. Then we put it into results. And then we return the array. That previous example is very hard to read. This translation now becomes incredibly easy. Much, much clearer, better communicated intent behind this code. You can tell what's actually going on. So this is coming soon. This is going to be standard. This is not all roses. There are downsides and pain you get in here. There are little bits you have to watch out for. Firstly, you still do have to catch errors. This still is an asynchronous process. So as with promises, where if you don't have a catch or callbacks, where if you forget to put in the callback, you can miss errors completely. Uh, here with async await, you're going to do the same thing potentially. You still have to have error catching somewhere. These are just promises under the hood, though, so you've got a few options. You could, any async function does just return a promise, so you can just put dot .catch on the end and catch it as if it were a promise without knowing the internals at all. Everything really is still just promises here. So we can do error catching like this very nicely. Or alternatively, we've now got all the normal tools you have. So you can do try catch, for example. And this try catch here catches any synchronous errors that happen in your code in this function, but also any rejections from any promise that you're waiting on in this function. It treats them all as if you, it was synchronous code. And you can really easily think of it as synchronous code almost all the time. And for the cases where this easily drops in, it makes thinking about your code much, much simpler. One other thing you have to watch out for is nested functions. Just because the outer function is asynchronous doesn't mean you can use await in an inner function. So here, inside map, we pass a function to map, and we try and use await in there, and you can't do that. That is a syntax error. There's a few reasons for this. Um, the big one is that it's incredibly complicated to do in the JavaScript runtime implementations we have in browsers now, so there's, there's no practical way they're going to do it. The other one is that it breaks loads and loads of expectations for JavaScript code all over the place that, again, make it impossible. So this isn't ever going to happen, but you can work around this. You might assume that you just have to make the function inside map async, uh, like this, but that doesn't actually work either. What that means is that map ends up creating a bunch of promises, but map doesn't understand promises, so it doesn't resolve them. And the end data you get in friend data isn't the actual resolved, fulfilled data. It's a list of promises. And when you try and just get the name out here, you, you're reading out of a promise, which doesn't actually work. So instead, what you have to do, and what you do generally whenever you start to get in trickier cases, is just fall back to promises. Promises are still under the hood here everywhere, and you still need to understand promises if you want to use this stuff. And at any point, if you've got more interesting cases like this, you just use promises on top. Await promise.all of our collected set of data. And this allows you to build a promise and then await on it and manage it nice and cleanly. Finally, um, this ends up most of the time producing some really, really nice, much, much simpler, easier to write and understand code. Uh, and because of that, it becomes very easy to overuse it. It's easy to just write, await this, await that, await the other. Where in JavaScript normally you might think about, oh, well, I don't want to actually wait for all of these in sequence. That would be very slow. You want to do them in parallel. They don't depend on each other. You can make your program slower if you're not careful by doing operations in sequence when you don't need to. And it does, if you're not careful, encourage that kind of behavior. So you need to watch out for that sort of thing and be aware of exactly what's happening when your program is running here. So this all sounds very exciting, uh, slightly crazy, but in an interesting way. And maybe you want to start actually using this and putting this into action. You can immediately, uh, in the new versions of Chrome, this is live and out, 
Um, Edge has actually had it for ages, longer than any other browser, which is quite impressive um, and surprising. Uh, and is, but is behind a flag, so you have to turn something on in your browser there. Firefox have got it implemented and ready to go in Firefox 52, which is coming early next year. Uh, and it's implemented in WebKit and ready to go, but nobody knows when that's going to end up in a new version of Safari. If you want to use it before it's out in all of these browsers, if you're not prepared to just target the newest version of Chrome and nothing else, uh, Babel has excellent support for this, taking it right the way back to ES3, I think. It will compile back into plain, very simple vanilla JavaScript. TypeScript 2, which is the current newest version, will compile it back into the generator form we've looked at here, but doesn't actually take it back further than that. So it only works in environments where you have generators. But TypeScript 2.1, which lands probably next week, extremely soon, does have support for taking this right back to ES3, so you can use this exciting, lovely async await magic in IE6, if that's the way you want to go. With this, we now actually have explicit high-level async constructs. You can say, I am going to run this, and then at this point, I'm going to do an async operation, I'm going to wait for the response, and then continue. And you can say exactly that. Nothing else, no worrying about how function scopes, how other details are going to fight with this. You can precisely, accurately say what your code actually does. With this, we end up in a much better place. You can communicate with your fellow developers directly through your code. Your code says what you mean. You can share your ideas and your solutions accurately and effectively, and we can work together with all of this and build better software. Thank you very much.